Walmart. Why is this line bicycle lane blocking this sidewalk? Y'all need to come and get it. Looks like it's already been run over once. That front wheel. And know who that man is and know what he stood for. And if we got back to just putting ourselves in his his position and sacrifice ourselves for others and put some others first instead of our own, you know, ideals and agendas, I think it would help us out as a community a whole lot. Nathan Clark, I appreciate you spending some time with us, especially uh, in light of this tragedy, knowing that you're the father of children who attend private school and you're concerned about them as well, but appreciate you and appreciate your service to that community. Thank you, sir. Another tragedy at the southern border, a fire at an immigration detention center in Mexico near the Texas border last night. At least 40 people have been killed. The fire was at Mexico's National Migration Institute in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, across the border from El Paso, Texas. The Mexican president said migrants at the center started the blaze as a protest against deportation. They reportedly put mattresses on the doors of the building and set fire to them. At that time, 68 men from Central and South America were being held at the facility. Most were of Venezuelan descent. In addition to the fatalities, 29 people were injured and are in serious condition, highlighting the dangers of illegal immigration. The fire is the latest tragedy associated with illegal immigration at our southern border. And more is taking place on a daily basis. Joining us now to discuss the heavy toll taken on human life, we have former Border Patrol Chief Rodney Scott. Rodney Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. Of course, Rodney, I, I need to ask you, these dangers that the migrants face on their trek to the U.S. border, often not talked about or highlighted enough, uh, the most recent tragedy, 39 migrants dead in a fire that broke out in a detention facility uh, in northern Mexico. You also have the 53 that died in the tractor trailer in San Antonio. Uh, how widespread is this? You know, these, these events get a lot of attention when the numbers are high, but the deaths associated with illegal migration and the cartels controlling our southwest border happen every single day. Uh, earlier this week, I think there were two different train events where people were locked inside uh, train cars and you know, there's only one or two that died, but like 15 went to the hospital. That's just as tragic. Any loss of life, life is tragic. And the really horrible, sad thing is this is preventable. I mean, not every death, but a lot of them are preventable if we just reestablish law and order on our border and got rid of the chaos that this administration has created. And to your point, Rodney, how much of this has to do with the fact that so many of these migrants think that it's a you know an easy one-way ticket straight over the border right now? That's really the marketing and the sales pitch. That's why we are seeing this mass migration. When this administration chose to re-implement catch and release, which in the simplest term basically means even when someone's arrested, in most cases, uh, they're, they're issued a court date and then released into the United States. They just see that as a win. So as long as that continues and the, you, you, people don't see an immediate consequence for an illegal action, this flow of human beings is going to continue pouring across our border. I got to highlight it's the cartel, how they use them. It's not just that the cartel is making money smuggling them. The cartel uses these people as human shields to shape the border, to completely overwhelm all law enforcement in areas very systematically so that they can bring in other threats, people that are willing to pay more money to not meet a border patrol agent or the narcotics, the fentanyl that we see pouring into our cities all across this country. Those are the threats that the illegal immigration is a, is a cover or a mask for. Rodney, I need to ask you about the fentanyl crisis uh, on the southern border. Um, just if you could highlight this for us, and, and, and how has it impacted the communities, not just on the border, but obviously throughout the country? Yeah, thank you for that last point. So people talk about or think about the border, and they think about a line in the sand, and there is a physical border. But please don't forget nothing stays there. So it's just a transit area. So what the threat we're seeing today more than ever before is China systematically uh, working with the cartels, sending precursor chemicals into Mexico. Mexico is actually, the cartels in Mexico are creating fentanyl. And the, the profit is so high and the commodity is such a small amount, it's easier to smuggle. 
but they they smuggle it through the ports of entry but they also smuggle it in between the ports of entry and again that's what we're missing when this massive amount of illegal immigration overwhelms border patrol they're not out they're not able to patrol the border where they should be and we have no idea what's coming into the country but what we do know is there is no shortage of fentanyl throughout the cities and towns of this country and it is killing more people the poison the cartels bring into this country are killing more people than our wars did than 9-11 did it's a real threat to this country it's a national security threat and we need to address it that way hooker in an unusual classroom game i was shocked i was shocked and that was when i was like you know what this is i'm over it uh thankfully no kids were touched thankfully you know but where at what point does sexualization you know begin in the eyes of, of these groomers so kids gave me the same account uh my daughter's class was lined up in order from uh youngest to oldest which is you know least mature to most mature um and then the other little girl's class was uh, offered candy gruber discovered the game was an adult drinking game version of rock paper scissors called bear hooker hunter uh, at which point now i understood at this time literally it just was like this aha moment like that's what the other side is talking about like i get it this is happening this is real the angry mom took action immediately pulling her daughter from school and calling the school's principal i believe that you know quick apology like hey we're sorry could have been you know in place during that meeting but it was more of a um you know we'll get back to you and when she got back to me um she said you know well we have while we agree that the game was inappropriate we don't find find that children were sexualized through it gruber believes more needs to be done i would have definitely fired the teacher um and i would hold accountable each level of administration that denied that having a child pose in front of a class um as a seducing you know hooker is not sexualization like they they need to be held accountable the school later apologized in a letter to parents admitting that the game quote did not meet our bar of excellence gruber says the experience taught her many lessons when you care about family you need to do your homework in schools and if you're not doing your homework in schools uh you know there's a problem but also you also you need to do your homework with who you're choosing to represent you as well and she's making sure people learn about what happened she has visited the state capital sat in senators offices and says this won't be the last people hear from her daniel monahan ntd news the nashville school shooter was on the psych a psychiatrist's care if her parents had notified law enforcement of this that shooting would never have happened so if you are a parent of someone that is under psychiatrist care you need to notify law enforcement if that had happened in Nashville all uh, those those people would still be alive those children would still be alive do the right thing people If your kids got a psychological problem, notify law enforcement. End of story. It's hit the reflection student apartments. We're told that no one was hurt. Atlanta police are also working to track down the shooter in a homicide investigation. Authorities say a 51-year-old man was shot and killed in southwest Atlanta last night. This happened at the Food Mart on Metropolitan Parkway near Dill Avenue. Police believe the shooting stemmed from a fight in the parking lot. Turning now to the tragic school shooting in Nashville, Tennessee, as investigators continue to identify a motive behind the horrific attack, officials are praising the police department for what is being called a, quote, textbook response police body cam video shows the officers moving swiftly through the hall of the covenant school on monday moments after entering the officers traveled to the second floor where they located the suspect fatally shooting her the shooting left six people dead which included three children and three adults who worked at the school president biden continued to push for a renewal of the assault weapon ban as others push for a hate crime investigation and in the wake of the shooting a metro atlanta gun store owner told the million dollar bond He's currently staying with his parents in Palo Alto, California. An arraignment is scheduled for Thursday. A spokesman for Bankman Free declined to comment. If convicted on all accounts, he could face more than 155 years in prison. A trial has been scheduled for October. On Wall Street, stocks ended lower today. 
Dow fell 38 points or 0.1 percent. S&P lost six points, 0.2 percent, and the Nasdaq dropped 53 points or half a percent. After the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, is anything else at risk of failing? That's one of the topics today at a Senate hearing. During this hearing, officials from the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and the U.S. Treasury answered questions from lawmakers. At the start of the hearing, Fed official Michael Barr said Silicon Valley Bank management is to blame for the banking crisis. He said its risk model was not aligned with reality. The bank failed because its management failed to appropriately address clear interest rate risk and clear liquidity risk. That interest rate risk and liquidity risk was cited, was highlighted by the supervisors of the firm beginning in November of 2021. The uh, the board and, uh, and sorry, the, the Federal Reserve Bank um, uh, brought forward these uh, problems to the bank and they failed to address them in a timely way. But it seems like many lawmakers disagree with Barr. They blame the Fed for not taking action. Senator Tim Scott says the Fed knew about Silicon Valley's bank practices for two years. Senator Elizabeth Warren called, uh, called it a massive failure in supervision. All attendees at the hearing agreed that the banking industry needs more rules and regulation, especially in regard to capital and liquidity standards. Currently, regulators may not actually understand the full scope of Silicon Valley Bank's problem. Senator John Kennedy asked Fed official Michael Barr about this. You stress tested from a wrong thing. As I said, Senator, I agree with you that it would be useful to test for higher rising interest rates. That's why in our alternative scenario, multiple scenario that we put in place for this year's stress test, we do that. These decisions were made before I arrived, but I agree with you. That it but it's like somebody to... going in for a, 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 a test for, uh, for COVID and getting a test for cholera, isn't it? I, I don't know enough about either of those tests to know. <laughs> Well, Lawmakers were also concerned if anything else was at risk of collapse. Senator Tina Smith asked if other banks are also suffering from interest rate risks and how the Fed is monitoring them. The banking system is, is sound and resilient. Uh, mo most banks are highly effective in managing interest rate risk and liquidity risk. It is the bread and butter uh, kind of work uh, of bank management. Uh, so we, we are monitoring uh, the financial system, monitoring the banking system. Uh, we're looking at interest rate risk and liquidity risk across the banking system to assess that. Uh, where banks need to do better at interest rate risk and liquidity risk management, uh, we're pointing that out. Senator Cynthia Loomis was concerned that small community banks would have to pay for a Silicon Valley ba bank's failure. There's a problem. The FDIC is funded by quarterly fees paid by banks. These fees are called assessments. So when the FDIC bailed out everyone at Silicon Valley Bank, it will need to raise these fees. This is to make sure it can bail out depositors for the next crash. Community banks may end up paying for this through higher assessments from the FDIC. Am I correct, Mr. Bloomberg? Well, as I indicated, uh, Senator, in regard to these two institutions, um, any cost to the deposit insurance fund from covering uninsured deposits is required by law to be recovered through an assessment on the banking industry. Exactly. If I make just one additional point, the, the law does give the FDIC authority in implementing that assessment. FDIC Chairman Martin Rundberg did not directly answer the question, but without a doubt, many banks will have to pay higher fees. Grimberg also defended the decision to pay out both insured and uninsured depositors. He said that if this didn't happen, other banks nationwide may have been in serious trouble. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve is conducting an open and thorough review of the bank collapses. The review will help the government to decide what actions to take next. The FBI didn't have a problem before this, and the fact that they paid him a personal visit out of all the ways to contact him, what should I make out of this? Well, it's pretty disturbing, I think. So my understanding is that the IRS typically doesn't just show up at your house uh, if there's an issue. And he also says there was no issue. He did all of his taxes. They actually owe him money, not the other way around. 
Um, the fact that that occurred on the same day he testified for this new select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government, which is about the federal government using its um, power in unconstitutional ways, is really ironic. And I think shows that it was, I mean, I can't say for certain, obviously, because we just don't know that sometimes coincidences happen, but it seems highly unlikely here. It seems as though it was an intimidation tactic because he had dared to speak out about the government's unlawful involvement in tech censorship. I'm starting to draw parallels to, like, you know, classic mafia movies where, like, if you did something, they would pay you a visit. Is, is the IRS sending a message here? That's what they seem to be trying to do. You know, they, try, they seem to be trying to say, if you uh, are going to bring to attention uh, what the government's unlawful activities, unconstitutional activities, well, we're going to punish you for it. We're going to make sure that you don't do that so other people don't do it as well. Um, you know, this isn't the sort of uh, conduct that you see in Western first world democracies. This is the sort of thing that you are more accustomed to in authoritarian regimes, I think. So I think Americans should really be concerned about this. Would you classify this as a form of sort of censorship of speech? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's fair. It's uh, They're basically trying to prevent people from speaking out about what, you know, what uh, journalist. I mean, this is a journalist, a journalist who's been vocal about what he thinks is the government's unlawful interference in um, social media censorship and the tech companies bad, uh, you know, bad censorship practices. And then you have an IRS agent showing up and what the message that's being sent is, if you dare to do this, you're going to be punished too. You know, you have to be worried about, you know, <laughs> the IRS going after you. So that's what they want people to think. They're so bold. It's really interesting too. You know, they're not, they're not doing this behind closed doors. They wanted people to know. So I think it's clear that they want Americans to get that message. Right, right. That, that's a very good point. It happens on the exact same day he was testifying yeah. on the Twitter files. What was exactly. your impression of that, of that hearing? Uh, well, the, the hearing was very interesting, and the conduct of a couple of Democrats, particularly Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, comes to mind, was shameful. Um, I mean, they were attacking journalists, uh, in addition to Taibbi uh, Michael Schellenberger, who have investigated this whole, um, this whole enterprise, the government big tech censorship. Um, and they were sort of trying to sneer them and suggest that they were doing this for opportunistic reasons, that they shouldn't be listened to because the subcommittee was, um, you know, seen as a Republican, uh, politically, ideal, or sort of ideologically Republican committee, uh, when these were journalists who were talking about what they had discovered when investigating these issues. Um, it was really, uh, it was really embarrassing and un-American, frankly. Do you think maybe th there's a, a bit of politics in this, uh, where, you know, the right is doing something and then the left using the IRS is doing something in retaliation. Do you think there's a dynamic uh, here? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that's exactly what's going on. Um, you know, this is seen as a right-wing enterprise, even though it shouldn't be. Really, all Americans should be concerned about the government's involvement in social media censorship. Um, but it's been smeared as a sort of right-wing uh the concern and the left claims that they're just concerned about people's lives as though, you know, <laughs> when it's really much more complicated than that. And so it's clear that they're trying to use the IRS to go after political opponents, in my opinion. That's what this episode shows. All right. Thank you so much today, Janine. Pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Now it's just stills, but it's going to get to videos. And then eventually, because I do XR, it's going to be spatial in some way. And each step is going to be harder and harder to determine if that's, you know, is that real? Is that not real? Um, and so we're going to have to have basically AI on top of that to determine how real is that, you know, almost like a fact checker. Recently, Adobe, well known for the program Photoshop and other digital art programs, has been forced to pivot to generative AI art services, forced in that it needs to keep up with rapid changes in technology. Adobe says its recently released art program doesn't use copyrighted imagery like other programs do. Mid Mid Journey make a picture similar to the Pope Francis picture of anchor Don Ma wearing a 1990s white puffer jacket. Does it look real to you? Sean Marshall, NTD News. <laughs> You can hear 
Chansley saying, we are not Antifa. Jean-Pierre was not denying the authenticity of the footage. The response has been to attack the messenger, not the message. So why does the media want to refuse to report on the entire story? Why would they all be so against seeing more video? Well, that's a relevant question to ask. And this reminds me in some ways of the footage of Nick Sandman, the high school Trump supporter who stood with a smile as a Native American beat his drum. If the media had released the entire video, you would have seen a third group of black Hebrew Israelites screaming at the high school kids and responsible for the real mess. But the media withheld that. His career. Why would he want to jeopardize his credibility and anger them? I mean, is no one concerned about the Senate Majority Leader directly calling for his censorship? No matter what you think of that day, it is imperative that we see everything, especially exculpatory evidence. Then you can make up your mind. For that matter, then judges can make better sentencing decisions. But the narrative already got out there. It led the way. How can Carlson be accused of cherry-picking video when that's exactly what lawmakers did on the January 6th Select Committee? What we are seeing is additional footage that provides context for us to make better decisions. You've seen the way that Democrats have treated Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger the journalist Elon Musk provided internal Twitter communications that showed collusion on a mass scale and severe censorship. This is happening simultaneously. Democrats are very scared and very unhappy about some of their secretive methods being exposed. You can see it in their eyes. They are calling Matt Taibbi a so-called journalist to reduce his credibility. That's the tactic. Attack the person to demean them. Don't attack the substance. If you can denigrate the person then they won't pay attention to the message. You can recognize that there were illegal acts committed on January 6th and also admit that some people may be wrongly detained. They are not mutually exclusive. To that point, former Trump official Cash Patel commented, we're not saying every January 6th prisoner has been overcharged. Some of those that committed violent acts should be punished and should be sent to prison. But as we've seen, with the footage that Speaker McCarthy released to Tucker, and hopefully the rest of the world, we're seeing all of these individuals that were so-called labeled these violent terrorists, as Fang Fang Swalwell has now labeled them, not committing any acts of violence. But we do know, and what I put out on Truth Social, is that DOJ must come forth, and these judges must act appropriately to say, where has this evidence been that hasn't been provided to anyone? Were there any Brady violations? That's the critical, important evidence of innocence or impeachment evidence, as we call it. Giglio information. Our constitutional rights to the Supreme Court that must be issued to every defendant. But telling the teams over at Pyramid Records and Real America's Voice were able to record a handful of January 6 prisoners called the J6 Prison Choir, singing the national anthem, mastered that audio, and then superimposed it behind Trump's vocal track of the Pledge of Allegiance in a tune called Justice for All. Over the weekend, that song broke records by becoming the number one song on iTunes, topping Miley Cyrus, Tim McGraw, and Morgan Wallen. A music video was released exclusively on Rumble. Take a look.
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. singing our anthem while Trump recites the Pledge of Allegiance was able to skyrocket to number one on iTunes. It's one of those serendipitous magical things where truth meets art. I don't know when the national anthem last made number one, perhaps when Whitney Houston sang it, but it's great to see that. Hey, Bernie. Creates a ripple effect through the force that makes us far less ready than we need to be. Austin says this comes at a time of high tensions with Russia, China, and Iran. Later in the hearing, Tupperville responded, saying, My hold has nothing to do with the Supreme Court's decision to the excess of abortion. This is about not forcing the taxpayers of this country to fund abortion. When implementing the policy last month, the Pentagon argued that service members stationed in certain states now have less access to abortions than other service members. Tupperville on Tuesday said that this has always been the case. Poland's restrictive policies, Japan, Djibouti, all these theaters have, have, have abortion policy. As of 12 days ago, y'all got the, the American taxpayer on the hook to pay for travel and time off for elective abortions. He added that it's supposed to be Congress that implements such laws, not the Pentagon. In other Pentagon news, some House Republicans are reportedly calling on the DOD to fire four of its doctors. NTD previously reported on the doctors who wrote this article for the American Journal of Public Health. In the article, they appeared to advocate for cross-sex procedures for the kids of service members. They went as far as to say that children can begin participating in their medical decision-making as early as age seven years. Now, the Daily Caller received this letter, which was reportedly sent by House Republicans to Secretary Austin, calling on the doctors to be fired. The letter says, if DOD advocates for the chemical castration of seven-year-old children to further a radical left-wing political agenda, we lose our moral standing in the world. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. Department of Health and Human Services and identifies as a woman. They locked our account for hateful conduct, and we spent the next eight months in Twitter jail. We learned the hard way that censorship guards the narrative, not the truth. In fact, it guards the narrative at the expense of the truth. Elon Musk bought Twitter in October last year and reinstated the Babylon Bee on the platform. Journalist Michael Schellenberger also testified at the hearing. Well, what if the shoe were on the other foot? Consider how you would feel if the following occurred. Twitter suspended a woman for saying trans women are women. Facebook censored accurate information about COVID vaccine benefits. Twitter censored a Harvard professor for saying children needed to be COVID vaxxed annually. The vice chair of the subcommittee, Republican Congressman Buddy Carter, also voiced his concerns. The trust in the federal government is, is a historical low. It's also low with the um, social media companies. So when the two of these combined or collide, then Americans are worried and concerned. And I think we're all concerned here. In his testimony, Dylan called on lawmakers to consider legal action to protect against viewpoint censorship, including potential reforms to Section 230. This law provides immunity to online platforms that post third-party content. The Communications and Technology Subcommittee has sole jurisdiction over proposed reforms to Section 230. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Feel their organs. These crimes against humanity are unimaginably cruel. For years, China has been matching patients with organs at speeds unimaginable in the West. Last year, securing a heart for a patient in Wuhan took four days. In 2020, doctors presented a Chinese woman with four hearts to choose from in just 10 days. And in 2005, after a phone call from a top Chinese health official, two hospitals in China delivered two livers to that official within 24 hours. 
over in the U.S., it's common for patients to wait a year for a heart. Right now, over 100,000 Americans are on the national transplant wait list. It's common for patients to die waiting. Without a voluntary organ donation system like America's, China became the top destination for organ tourism in early 2000s. Foreigners travel to China for organs, drawn in by the extreme short wait times. A question the West has been asking China for years, where do the organs come from? Ethnic groups targeted for this mass harvesting include Uyghurs, who suffer from Xi Jinping's ongoing genocide, and the Falun Gong, whose peaceful meditation and exercise practices and exceptional good health make their organs highly desirable. Uyghurs are a Muslim minority from China's Xinjiang region, while Falun Gong is a peaceful meditation practice with followers spread across China and the globe. Beijing has been persecuting both, arresting, detaining, and torturing them inside prisons, with numbers in the millions. Reports of Beijing's forced organ harvesting first came to light in 2006. Fast forward to 2023, it's still going on. We also know through open source Chinese language media that, that elderly, high-ranking Chinese Communist Party officials have received replacement organs from the very people they despise, like the Falun Gong, like the Uyghurs, and oppose, and there's one particular hospital, Army Hospital 301 in Beijing, that excels it.